Good evening, everyone. Well, that's not a Catholic welcome. Good evening, everyone. There we go. Uh, welcome to our presentation about Father Capon this evening. We have Mr. Scott Carter from the Diocese of Wichita who will be presenting, and he will also be talking to us about uh, Father Capon, his legacy, and the current state of his uh, uh, role for um, canonization. So if you would, please welcome Father, uh, Mr. Scott Carter. And we'll take it away. All right, thanks for uh, being here tonight. And um, it's good to be with you. I am from the great state of Kansas. Uh, the last time I was in Columbia was actually because of basketball. Uh, I was headed out to North Carolina uh, for the NCAA tournament probably about 16 years ago. Uh, and we stopped to, to visit, a, have dinner with a friend who was coming to school here. And this was when I was in college. Uh, but if it's any consolation, it's because I'm a Wichita State basketball fan, not a KU basketball fan. So <laughs> uh, if there are any KU basketball fans out there, congrats. But otherwise, uh, that's just about <laughs> as much as I care. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, um, well, let's go ahead and get started with a quick prayer, if we, if we will. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us this evening to uh, hear your voice speaking through the life of your servant, Father Emil Capon. We ask that you open our hearts uh, to receive the word that you wish to speak to us, and we ask this especially through the intercession of uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So uh, these uh, screens are mostly up here just for something for you guys to look at other than just me. It's always fun to share some, some photos. Um, towards the end, I've got a video that I do want to share with everybody. But uh, for now, it's mostly just for the photos. So uh, to begin with, I've already gotten asked twice the most common question that I get and how in the world do you pronounce this priest's name <laughs> and uh, I laugh because uh, I grew up in Wichita and it's very common to hear Capon and it wasn't until uh, many years later that I, I first really heard people pronounce it Capon um, but as it turns out uh, that is the way that most of the POWs know him as and uh, it's, it's sometimes a, a point of contention, uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but what I've come to realize, and I think understand, is that he probably was known by both Capon and Capon during his life. And honestly, when he was in the army, who knows what other people may have ended up calling him too, trying to pronounce his name. Uh, but uh, he grew up in Pilsen, Kansas, which is about an hour or 15 minutes north of Wichita. And uh, there, I think most people know him as Capon. And I think that's why it's stuck in the Wichita area. Now, the story is supposedly that his mother had passed down that originally, when his father immigrated from the Czech Republic, it was Capon, but people just called him Capon, and so they went with it. Um, now, you talk to people in another parish that he, he served in as a priest in central Kansas that was also a Czech-speaking parish, and they, they and their descendants swear that they always knew him as Capon, and again in the army they knew him as Capon. So I think maybe perhaps when he, he moved on he introduced himself as Capon, but uh, it's hard to break old habits, and so there's a, a, lot of, a lot of both that you get, and you may even hear both from me as well. Uh, it's, it's likely I will slip back into Capon, although I try to, try to call him Capon now as well. Um, either way, what I'm told is his, his first name was pronounced Emil, uh, and that's the most reliable I've, I've gotten on the pronunciation of names. So uh, either way, he knows who we're talking about, and I think uh, his story is, is one that's uh, a great inspiration. Uh, I came first to, to know about him uh, when I was in high school, uh, senior in high school, and we had a priest who had formerly served in the Army and had gone to his high school, Cape and Mount Carmel, and he said, hey, there's this priest that you all need to know about. Uh, he's from the Diocese of Wichita, and he's important. And he didn't tell us. Uh, we were at the rival Catholic high school in Wichita <laughs> that it was the namesake of Cape and Mount Carmel. But he bought us this book, Shepherd in Combat Boots. And that's when I first encountered his story. Uh, I got to know him better as, as the years went by, and, and finally this position opened up, and I, I get to share about him. 
and it's really a great privilege uh, because I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's such a unique opportunity to be able to delve into the live, life of someone we believe is a saint and be able to share that, to promote his cause and um, his example. And I think it's, it's even better for us here in the Midwest because he lived just over 100 years ago in the Midwest, certainly understands what it means to, to be from this area, uh, to grow up on a farm, to grow up in America, to love both God and our country, and uh, to be able to try and, and serve both. And I think it's a wonderful example for, for us in our times. Uh, sure, he didn't have cell phones or TVs or anything like that, um, but he, he still, I think, understands very much uh, what the age and, and time that we're going through. So uh, I want to start just, uh, next slide, I think is a picture of him growing up uh, on the farm. And I start with this. The, so that's a picture of him when he's about six years old. Uh, on the left, uh, on the right is his parish, St. John Nepomucene in Pilsen, Kansas. So he grew up about three miles away from the church. His dad was an immigrant from the Czech Republic uh, with some German roots as well. His mother uh, was uh, born in Kansas, but two Czech immigrants uh, who moved into to Marion County, County, where he's from. And they grew up on a farm. And they rented the farmland that they were on. They were not rich by any means. And that's where Emil grew up. Uh, he ended up having one brother who was about seven years younger than him. But his life on the farm there really, I think, paved the way for who he would later become. He was a very humble man. He was a very hardworking man. And uh, he knew how to get by with very little. I always say that there's two things that, uh, two quotes that I've read that describe him well that I think shaped him into the man he would become and, and a future saint. And I think it offers us some consolation too because if we start, I think, with those two simple things, maybe we can, we can get there as well. The first, his mother said that he was always close to God. So um, that took, manifested itself in many different forms. Often he would ride his bike to school uh, uh, ride his bike to church actually before school so he could serve at mass. Simple thing that a lot of us have probably done uh, in, in the past, but he was dedicated to that even when the weather was challenging, uh, it was maybe snowing or windy or cold, he would be dedicated to getting there early to, to serve mass for his parish priest. Sometimes on the way when the weather was nicer, people would see him with uh, some wildflowers that he had collected on the handlebars, taking him into the church and placing them before the statue of the Blessed Mother. He had a great devotion to Mary. Uh, it's not like Emil spent his whole days in prayer, but what he did is he interspersed his days with prayer. And so sometimes his mother said when he was outside playing, uh, she would see him kneeling down in front of like their, their tree or bush, uh, practicing his, his Latin for, for serving the altar. Sometimes when the teachers were at school, the, the playground was right in front of the church, and they said that they would look around and they wouldn't see Emil out there. And then, sure enough, he had gone into the church just for a few minutes to say hello to our Lord. So he was always close to God. And the second thing was that he was always looking to help other people. And so his, uh, his teachers say that a lot of the times they, they had a, like a two-room schoolhouse, so there were several grades with them, and I think there were two or three teachers there. And the teacher said that they noticed that father was always looking out to help the other students. And if, they, if one of the students was having trouble understanding something, he would go over to them and help explain it to them uh, before the teachers would even realize what was going on. Uh, at home, he was always willing to do the chores. And perhaps maybe a little bit of a sign of his extraordinary nature uh, is that he, he rarely did them complaining. I think he understood his role on the farm and that everybody needed it to chip in to, to help out for the family to make it. But he loved, you know, weeding in the garden uh, when he was younger. When he was older and in, in seminary, he would return for harvest a lot of the times during summer and help out there. And I think it was those two things put together that, that led him really to his desire to be a priest. And uh, initially, he wanted to be a missionary, a missionary to China. Uh, he read the Columban Fathers magazine and uh, just these stories of these heroic men and, and probably sisters as well 
who went overseas to, to share the faith with people who needed to hear about it. And that tugged at his heart. And he realized, uh, being from a very poor family, that they couldn't afford his education as a priest. And so he thought, well, if I write to this Columba Mission Society, maybe they'll take me in and, and I'll be able to become a priest. And he actually got permission from the society to enter. But when his parish priest found out, he said, wait a minute, <laughs> we need you here. We need speakers who know the language, who know Bohemian, and can speak to the people uh, in their own language. And so he, he, between his pastor and several other people that his pastor found, paid for a father to become a priest. And uh, there's a couple pictures, uh, or a picture up here. And he finally did become a diocesan priest, and interestingly enough, uh, it does not happen much anymore, but he was sent to his home parish to serve. And uh, he really loved being a priest, and this is a picture with him with several of the boys at recess. Uh, again, the, the, being a farming community, they, they didn't have a ton of money at the time, uh, but he had bought baseball equipment and was, uh, loved to play baseball with the kids, I guess fitting for opening day. Um, but uh, you can see a little bit of the equipment here. He also taught them how to play soccer, something that he learned at uh, seminary. But he loved to play baseball, and it's, it's funny, if you go to Pilsen, they still tell stories about uh, how he'd be out there playing on one team, and then as quickly as they got ahead by a few runs, uh, he, the students would look, and he'd be batting for the other team and hitting a home run, and they'd be like, hey, what's going on? He just, he wanted to help out everybody. I think he was always kind of a, a bit of an underdog. Uh, when he was in seminary, uh, he, he loved to play sports. He, he was about good for two points every game in basketball, they said, but in his journal, he would write about the score, no matter, you know, what it, it was. Uh, he loved writing about the sports. In football, one of his professors said, you know, it's funny because he was kind of a scrawny guy. He was, he was tall, but, you know, not someone that you would think would excel at football. And he said, honestly, our, our team was pretty anemic. <laughs> we, we didn't win very many games, but he said, we'd always look, and somehow... Nobody knew how, but Father Emil would be crawling out of the bottom of a dog pile. Uh, he was always in on the action. He loved playing sports. was always, you know, in, in it, even if uh, he wasn't the, the most uh, athletic or, you know, talented man. But that was just kind of the guy he was. He wanted to be there uh, where everything was going on. He did well in his studies and everything, but he wasn't like an outstanding student by any means. Um, but he was very dedicated uh, as a priest. So there's a line, um, he eventually got, uh, you know, he, he loved being a priest, but there were a lot of difficulties serving in his, his home parish as well. And he petitioned to, to enter the army while World War II was going on. And at first, he was turned down. His bishop said, no, we need you here. Your, your pastor is aging. He needs your help and everything. But he persisted, and he eventually was assigned to be an auxiliary chaplain at one of the Air Force bases not far from Pilsen. Uh, and then he just, he, he, he never relented, and he wrote the bishop uh, another time, and he said, you know, when I was ordained, I was determined to spend myself for God, and I was uh, determined to do that cheerfully, no matter the circumstances I'd be placed in or how hard a life I'd be asked to lead. And he says, that's why I want to join the army. Uh, because I feel like right now, you know, there's a lot of difficulties. Not everybody uh, wants to listen to me as their priest because they grew up with me. But that's why I want to live in the army. And I think that spirit stuck with him uh, throughout his time as a priest uh, and in the army. And in a lot of ways, you know, that missionary calling that he felt to join the Columban Fathers, I think is something that eventually let, you know, lived itself out uh, in the army. So he served in World War II, uh, came back to the United States for a little while, but really felt that tug again and, and went back into the Army uh, in 1949. In 1950, at the beginning of the year, he was sent to Japan to join the 1st Cavalry Division, who was mostly an occupying force, but he was actually sent to uh, the unit that was training in case there would be an actual war. Well, sure enough, that summer in June, the end of June, the North Korean Army uh, crossed the border with South Korea and invaded. So at the end of World War II, uh, well, before World War II, Japan had control of, South, of all of Korea. After the war, uh, the United Nations decided, okay, we're going to split it up uh, for now, 
the Russians kind of were taking control of the North, the Americans were taking control of the South, and there were supposed to be elections to unify the country, and things were supposed to work out. Well, obviously that didn't happen. The North Koreans elected a, a communist leader, South Koreans elected a mostly democratic leader, um, and both sides really didn't like each other very much and, and wanted to reunify. But it was the North Koreans that struck first. And so being in Japan with the 1st Cavalry Division, Father Capen was really some of the first units that were sent over. There was an infantry uh, unit that was sent ahead of him, but he was there in three weeks' time after the war started. And right away, he made a name for himself there. Now, he had seen a little bit of fighting before in World War II, but he served in Burma and India and really didn't see that much intense fighting. And he said, this war is a lot different. Uh, unfortunately for the Americans, uh, they had a real tough go of it at first. And the first couple of months of the fighting was, was very intense. Uh, the North Koreans had better tactics. They had some Russian tanks that were helping them control the territory. The Americans were using a lot of leftover weapons from World War II, and so their rifles and everything, uh, their bazookas at first, uh, the, the ammo, the rockets would just bounce off the side of the tanks because the armor was improved so much. Uh, a lot of the times the guns weren't working as properly the, as they should. And then the North Koreans also, uh, they, were, they were tricky with their tactics and they, they knew the land much better. And they would actually send units around to the rear of the American forces and then they would attack at the front. And when the Americans tried to retreat, all of a sudden they were caught in a trap. And so three times, three times Father Capon's up there with his men and he says, we had to retreat. And he says, three times I nearly got killed, uh, but thankfully the Lord has taken care of me so far, and I think it's so I can help out my fellow soldiers. Uh, so Father Capon uh, had to es escape several times. One of these times that he was escaping, or one of these times that they were ambushed before he had to escape, uh, a squad came back, and they said, our squad leader got hit. He ordered us to retreat. We need someone to go get him. And they looked around, and all of the medics were currently busy elsewhere. And Father's there, and he hears this story, and he's, he looks at his assistant and says, all right, let's go. And so they figure out where he is, and they go and get this guy. Well, as they're out there, uh, they end up finding another guy who had been hit, whose buddy had been shot, and you know, had no one to tell him that he was still out there. And so they, they drag these two guys back to safety, under machine gun fire and their small arms fire the whole time. And uh, eventually word gets back to the commanders and he's awarded the Bronze Star, which is an award for bravery under fire. And he's given this award uh, about a month later in September. This happened at the beginning of August and uh, presented it you know, on the battlefield there and, and the troops come to learn about it. And I think it's interesting because in the, the testimony uh, for him to receive this award, it says that uh, he was given it because it, it, in part because it helped boost the morale of the men who were fighting. See, at first they had been under a pretty fierce attack. They, they were having trouble sometimes even staying to fight. And uh, his commander said, what happened was when the guys noticed that, not only, not just anybody, but their chaplain was out there uh, willing to risk his life to bring them back, made us realize that, hey, we're not going to leave anybody behind. And so they give him this award, and it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, monthly, Father Capon had to have to write reports for the military, and uh, he, you know, said paperwork. Uh, he, he probably got a, you know, kind of uh, had a sense of humor about it, or, or I'm sure it made him laugh. Uh, some of the reports, I mean, it, it asked questions like, okay, how many masses did you celebrate? How many communions did you hand out? How many extreme unctions did you give? How many confessions did you hear? All that sort of stuff. Uh, you get to the questions that are a little more goofy, uh, <laughs> not written for wartime, and it's, uh, where did you celebrate mass? Okay, on a table or on the hood of a Jeep. Uh, did you reserve this blessed sacrament? Uh, or where did you reserve the blessed sacrament? Well, he had to carry it on his person, so he said, on my person. Is there a candle burning in front of it? <laughs> no, his answer is just no. Well, he's writing these reports, and he includes it to his bishop. And the only thing he says to the bishop is he says, was awarded the Bronze Star. Well, sure enough, the bishop, being uh, a, a wise man, says, 
this makes for a great story. So he puts the, the word in the newspaper, uh, both the, the Catholic newspaper, but also the Wichita newspaper. Uh, and word finally gets back to Father that he was in the newspaper for this. And he said, man, I, I sure as heck better be careful when I write or else uh, uh, he's going to come find me here. But um, that was the sort of thing that he did. He was willing to be on the front lines for the men. And you can see, you know, in these pictures, the picture on the left there is, is him. Uh, he's, he's the right one of the trio there with a little bit of a cross on his, on his helmet. He wanted to be wherever the men were. He was willing to go to the front lines. He didn't want to just hang out by the aid station. Sure, he was there a lot to help the men that came in. But sometimes it was just so that he could figure out where the action was and that he could get out there to meet him. One of the POWs that I got to talk with, his name was um, Bill Richardson. So Bill was just a corporal at the time, pretty low on the totem pole. Later, up, uh, later on, ended up retire, retiring as a colonel. But he says, you know, we got there a little bit after Father did, uh, kind of his reinforcements, and they were on the front lines. And he said, we got placed in the front lines, and sure enough, the first or second night, we got, came under fire. It was a pretty intense firefight. The North Koreans liked to attack at night, so you couldn't see where they were coming from. And he says, when day broke, everybody was kind of shell-shocked. And he said there was a, a bit of a mist or smoke or whatever, and he sees this guy walking towards him. And as he gets closer, he comes up and he introduces himself and says, hi, I'm Kapan. And he realizes it's the chaplain. And Father went around to each of the men in Bill Richardson's squad and introduced himself, said, hi, where are you from? How are you doing? That sort of thing. And he said... I came to know him several times when we were out there on the battlefields, and he became the ideal chaplain for me. And he said, later on, when I became an officer and commanded people, I always held them to, to father's standards. He said, nobody ever lived up to it. <laughs> but he was the ideal. He made me understand just how important a chaplain was. He said one time, unfortunately, he had a friend. Uh, he, he looked over at him and, and saw... The, the stump that he was sitting on just go up in, in this big fireball from an explosion. And he said, you know, Father's presence there for the men, for, for himself and for stuff like that, yeah, help get their minds right and um, put them in the proper place. But um, he would do simple things on the battlefields to bring the peace of Christ, as it says, to the men. Uh, that, that quote up there is a quote that he gave in a radio address, which is the only audio recording we have of him in Japan, just a few weeks before he was sent to battle. He says, the peace which God gives is a gift that exists in suffering and want and even in time of war. And I think it's quite remarkable to hear stories of how Father brought peace to the men on the battlefields and in the prison camps uh, in which he served. Some of the men say that they, they met him literally in a foxhole uh, one of his friends who was close to him in the camp, Lieutenant Walt Mayo, was an auxiliary observer. And he says, yeah, I met him. We were actually trying to occupy the same foxhole as artillery fire was coming in at us. Um, and he said, it was funny. He said, like, he was always on the lookout for people that he could go visit or help or bodies that he could um, bring off the, off the battlefield. And he says, honestly, we, I, we kept having to tell him to keep his head down because they, he'd be shot at so often. Uh, uh, but he was, wanted to be out there in the foxhole with the men. And some of the times it was, it was very simple. Uh, he, he wore the ammo belt just like anyone else. He kept his mask kit in there after his first couple mask kits were destroyed in the Jeep. Uh, but he would also bring things like apples, oranges, that he could offer to the men. He would bring some extra water in a canteen to give them something to drink. These are guys who are probably 18, 19 years old, halfway around the world, going through a lot. And that simple act of kindness was the opening that he used to then ask if they wanted him to pray for them. Uh, and uh, most of the time, the guys said that, yeah, they would, he would pray with them. Uh, Paul was telling me that uh, one time when they got back from, was Iraq, Afghanistan? Yeah, Iraq. Um, they had uh, Tibor Rubin come and speak to them. Tibor was a Jewish man who was in a, a prison camp in his native land of Hungary, I think, in World War II, came to the United States in gratitude for being liberated by U.S. forces and wanted to serve in the Army. And so he served. He ended up 
uh, being awarded the Medal of Honor later as well for his bravery on the battlefield. But he said, one time uh, I had been hit by some shrapnel in my back and I had my head down in the foxhole and I was feeling really sorry for myself when all of a sudden into my foxhole jumps Father Capon. And he says, I didn't know him at the time. But he says, hey, he, he said, you rub some oil on my back. He didn't know what it was, but it was probably holy oil, right? And he says, can I pray with you? And Tibor says, sure. And he says, I was shocked when Father started praying the Hebrew scriptures with me. Now, I'm guessing that it wasn't actually in Hebrew, but the fact that Father knew he was Jewish, knew some of the Old Testament to pray with him, uh, is just the kind of man that Father was, wanting to reach everybody. Um, let's see, next photo. So this is one of the classic photos. This one uh, actually used to be in black and white, was recently colorized. Um, so on the battlefields, uh, some of the men, again, said that the Father was just almost impervious uh, to mortar fire, gunfire, whatever. Uh, sometimes he would be walking down the streets, they said, just like he was in a big city, and they tell him, you got to take cover. Uh, and he said, it's all right, I've got God's armor on. And uh, this is a, an instance where his pipe, which he's holding up in his hand, literally got shot out of his mouth by a sniper's bullet. Um, and, you know, he's grinning from ear to ear, right? <laughs> um, that was the kind of smile he had. Uh, one of the men uh, said that uh, this is how he remembered him, with that smile. Well, um, you know, Father knew, I think, that his life was certainly in danger. I mean, he wasn't oblivious to that fact, but that didn't stop him. And he, he, he wrote home several times that he was convinced it was the prayers of loved ones that helped him escape. But he said, you know, I, I'm convinced that God is, has me here for a reason, and I think he was bound and determined to do as much good as he could until his time came. Well, eventually, uh, the, the time was up for, uh, for him and the men of the 1st Cavalry Division. They were sent north. Uh, actually, sorry, next slide. Uh, before we get there. Uh, so this is a picture of him celebrating Mass on the Jeep. I think it's the last picture of him that we have. Uh, it took place October 7th, 1950, and just south of the North Korean border. And uh, I think it's just a, a great illustrative picture because he's, he's there with his vestments. He's got his combat boots on and everything. Um, but there's another story, actually, that uh, comes from this book that I love. And it's by a Captain Joseph O'Connor, who is Catholic. And he says that not too long, a few weeks before this picture, we, we came into town, a town that we had recaptured from the communists. And Father comes up to me as I'm setting up the battalion headquarters, and he says, hey, can we celebrate a mass for the men? And Captain O'Connor looks at him and says, I don't know, it's pretty hot here still. We're getting a lot of fire. I don't think you should be here right now. Father says, well, with all due respect, sir, I think that's exactly why we need to have a mass. And Captain O'Connor says, okay. So he says, there's this courtyard of this abandoned house. Uh, I think we could set up there. Would that be okay? Father says, sure. So they set up mass. He's probably celebrating on an, a table that they found or some ammo crates or something. And uh, Captain O'Connor decides to go, and he says as many men as he could spare go along with him. Sure enough, Father starts celebrating mass, and it's not long before the fire starts coming in. And some artillery fire opens up on the hill a couple hundred yards behind them. And he says, we start looking around and getting very nervous. And he says, in the military, it we call it a bracket, and he was pretty sure the artillery was, uh, you know, they were shooting it on either side until they got the, the calculations down right to hit them. And he says, we looked up at Father, no change in his demeanor. He says, he's as completely calm as if he was celebrating Mass in Pilsen. And the strength of his voice uh, and, and his determination made us stay. But he said, we were still pretty nervous, and I was pretty sure that they had us spotted, and it was only a matter of time before they hit us. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the last barrage of fire lands 400 yards away and completely stops. And he says, that told me that they thought that they hit us. And I don't know what happened, if it got miraculously deflected in midair or what, but I believe something happened that day. And he says, Father keeps on celebrating Mass afterwards, comes up to me 
uh, thanks me and says, hey, can I borrow a Jeep to get to the next battalion? And he said, yes, happy to send him on his way. He said, that day I realized that he was not afraid of mortal things, that he had something greater in his heart. Um, what's the next slide? Hope. Hope is what Father had in his heart. So, um, Pope Francis has a great line in his exhortation on holiness. He says that, um, he says that holiness, first of all, he says holiness is the most attractive face of the church. So, all the things that we can do as a church, teaching, um, even beautiful churches, beautiful artwork, uh, all that sort of stuff, holiness is the most attractive face. It's what's going to attract people to the church. And he goes on to say that each saint is a message that the, the Holy Spirit sends to us for a specific time. Um, so he says that there are a specific message that our Lord sends. Uh, the Holy Spirit takes from the riches of Jesus, the infinite riches of Jesus, and, and gives to a specific need. Well, there's a whole lot of things that we can say about Father Capon. And certainly his acts of charity are way up there. You know, you could frame a lot of what he does as the corporal spiritual works of mercy. But one thing that I think stands out to me is the virtue of hope. Now, this is a virtue we don't talk about very often, right? We talk about faith. We talk about love. We don't often talk about hope. Now, hope is, um, I think I got my <laughs> animations mixed up. If you click the next one here. So hope is the theological virtue uh, by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness uh, placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our strength, but on the strength of the Holy Spirit. So there's two things about hope. One is where it points us. So it points us to heaven, right? We, we have hope of getting to heaven. The second thing is how do we get there? Well, we, we have hope because Jesus gives us grace, right? Jesus is our Savior. He's the one who gets us there. Um, for instance, coming today, I had hope that I could get to Columbia today to talk to you guys. Otherwise, I wouldn't have left home, right? I wouldn't have uh, bothered to come. Um, so I had hoped that I could make it here. And I did, thankfully. Uh, now, how did I get here? Well, I had hoped that I could use our car to, to drive here, right? I didn't have hope that, uh, uh, that I would be able to fly on a private jet or something cool like that. Um, but I did have hope that our car would, would get us here. And it did, thankfully. So that's, that's kind of the two sides of hope. But hope is something that um, the Catechism says keeps man from discouragement. It sustains us in times of abandonment. Hope affords us joy even under trial. So the battlefield was one thing, but one of, the, one of the men sums it up well. He says, I think that was a dress rehearsal for what was to come next. So on the, the night of November 1st, morning of November 2nd, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, Father Capon, say I Cape and Capon. <laughs> uh, Father celebrates Mass for the, the battalions of the, his 8th Regiment, 1st Cavalry Division. And they're in North Korea. They're not far from the, the border with China. And uh, they're camping down for the night when all of a sudden, a whole, all hell breaks loose. And it turns out that they're surrounded, they're ambushed by the Chinese army. And that night, there are 800 uh, Americans in the 3rd Battalion. Uh, against 10 to 20,000 Chinese. Now, the Americans had better weapons and everything, but they were just completely outnumbered and uh, caught by surprise, weren't ready, and were completely isolated from any reinforcements. And so the first two battalions were ordered to retreat. The third battalion was ordered to cover. Ironically, Father had been with the first two battalions uh, before, who were, were north of them, uh, but the Protestant chaplain said, hey, let's switch, that way you can get some rest back behind, I'll go take the front lines. And so Father did, but they wake up shortly after midnight to this battle raging around him. And that's really when Father went to work, uh, even more than before. And the men said he was all over the battlefield, pulling guys to safety, giving them the last rites, praying over them, doing whatever he could uh, to rescue men. At one point, he was actually captured, but the Americans noticed and shot the, the guards who had him undercover, and he went right back to work. The men told him, hey, you're not wounded, you should try and escape, try and get out of here. His response was, no, my place is with the wounded. 
And he and another doctor, uh, Captain Anderson, decided to stay with the wounded men, even though they knew it might risk their own lives. So all through that battle, Father probably pulled 35, 40 guys to safety of this, uh, this little dugout. And eventually brokered a surrender when the Chinese were throwing grenades into the dugout and uh, saved the lives of those men. After he was captured, uh, over the next couple of days, they were still there, he notices this North Korean or Chinese soldier pointing his gun down at a ditch and quickly realizes what's going on. He walks over there, shoves the gun aside, and picks up an American soldier by the name of Herb Miller, who is about to get executed. Now, Herb had been lying there because a grenade had gone off and um, shattered his leg and said, you know, I thought it was the end. And then he said, I saw this man come over to me, pick me up, and he says, as we were walking off, I, I thought it was going to be the end there for both of us. But for some reason, the guard was so stupefied <laughs> that he didn't shoot both of us. He says, if, if it wasn't for Father Capon, I wouldn't be here today. Now, this is the battle that Father was later awarded the Medal of Honor for, which is the highest award that you can receive uh, during battle. But really, it was, it was the life in the prison camp that um, is, is perhaps the most remarkable thing. And uh, to get just a, a good feeling for what happened there, so the men were marched north about 60 miles. Uh, it started to snow on the way. Most of them still had their summer uniforms because they thought that the war was going to be over and they hadn't had time to get any winter uniforms to them yet. And as the winter progressed, it turned out to be the coldest winter that North Korea had had on record. And it got down to negative 20. I've heard negative 30. I've even heard negative 40 degrees that winter at night. So you can imagine uh, it was easy for some of the men to simply freeze to death if, if they weren't careful. Uh, a lot of the men slept in, in huts, uh, both in a valley and then later in a town. And the huts were, you know, mud huts with, around the walls, a dirt floor, uh, hay kind of roof. Sometimes the doors had newspaper over it to let some light in, but it certainly didn't help with the cold. And the huts were roughly nine feet by nine feet. And they had probably 10 to 14 guys in them. Now, this certainly helped with the cold because they were able to, to snuggle together and keep warm. They said they put their, their feet in the next guy's armpit to, to keep some heat in. But what it didn't help with was the disease that went around, the lice that went around that would attack them in. And the lice were a real problem. Uh, apparently, there were enough of them that, and the, the men were so hungry that it, they would suck a little bit of blood, and over the course of two or three days, if you didn't pick the lice off, you could easily die. And some of the guys say that other men committed suicide simply by not picking lice off of their bodies, which is an awful thing to think about. But Father and some of the other men said, no, we're not having this. And they would go and pick lice off the bodies uh, of their fellow men. And they would make a game out of it. They would count, say, hey, I got 54 here. <laughs> Someone else would say, well, I'm up to 62. <laughs> uh, and they would do anything they could to help these men survive. Uh, food was a problem. So the, the communists gave the men mostly cracked corn, millet, which is the little round stuff you see in bird seed that doesn't look appetizing in the least bit. They would get a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening. And for most of the men, their stomachs had a hard time digesting it. The father said, hey, you've got to eat this. I don't care how bad it is, you're eating it. Sometimes they would feed it to men, spoon feed it. But he would also go and try and steal other food. And they said, some of the men were like, we don't know if we should say this, but he was actually the best food thief we had. And we tried to figure out why. And we asked him, what makes you so good? And his response was, well, I pray to St. Dismas, the good thief, to help me as I go on my raids. <laughs> and so he would go out uh, at times into the, the fields to gather some extra corn or whatever he could find. At times they would make distractions and, and he would go into the storehouse and be able to stuff his pockets with rice or whatever he could find and bring it back to the men and share it with them. And perhaps even more impressive is that uh, even when he was sick and dying, he would give his food to the other men to eat as well. Uh, like I said, uh, dysentery and other diseases were problems and, and dysentery is a disease that 
If you're old enough like me, you can remember on the Oregon Trail, easily could die from dysentery. <laughs> um, well, dysentery was uh, a disease that you often lose control of your bowels. And for the men who had it, it was, it was just not only unpleasant, and you could think, uh, you know, with diarrhea and everything, a lot of times we go to Gatorade and everything, they didn't have much to drink. Um, Father Wood, he found this sheet metal. They didn't have very many pots or pans, but he found the sheet metal and he figured out a way to make it into a shape of a pot that wouldn't leak water. He would go and get uh, sticks and leaves and whatever he could find, start a fire, and melt the snow into clean drinking water for the men to drink. And it helped them with their health. Now another thing that he would do is he would take their clothing in different pots, or sometimes in the river, he would break through the sheet of ice, he would go to the river and he would wash their clothing in it, and he would change their clothing almost like you would change the clothing of a, of a baby, because he wanted to give them a sense of dignity uh, to help them remember just how important they were. Uh, one of the men that I had the privilege of meeting, his name was William Funches, he was from South Car Clemson, South Carolina, grew up on a farm, much like Father Capon, and he said, so he was captured uh, around Thanksgiving, a few weeks after Father, he was with a different unit. It wasn't until about two months later that they, he met Father in the prison camp when they were uh, moved camps. And he says, uh, the day I met Father, I saw this guy messing around on the ground. He said, I realized he was making a fire. And he said, honestly, it looked like trouble, and I didn't want to get in trouble with the guards, so I just was determined to skirt around <laughs> and go around him. But he spotted me, and he waved me over, and so I went up closer, and he was, uh, realized he was melting snow. And he says, would you like a drink of water? So Mr. Funches takes the drink, hands it back to Father Capon, and says, thank you. Uh, that was the first drink of water I've had in two months. And now I was sitting in, in William's uh, living room when he told me the story, and I look at him like, how did, how did you survive? And he said, I was eating snow up to that point to, to survive. But the next thing he said to me is, is what makes it the most memorable and one of my favorite stories. He said, that was the best drink of water I have ever had in my life. And he was about 89 years old when he told me this. In a quote from um, an article he had written, he says, you know, before I met Father Capon in the prison camp, I believed in God, but I felt that he was far away. After I met Father, I realized that God was very near, was all around us. Father Capon talked to us about God nearly every day. He prayed with us nearly every day, and he persuaded me that God was very close to us. He told us all we had to do was reach out to him. It was those little acts that he did, that um, his cheerfulness, his willingness to serve God, no matter how hard the difficulties, that gave the men hope. Um, it, it, it gave them the will to keep fighting. It was easy for a lot of the men to give up in that prison camp. The communists would try and knock it out of them. They would try and steal their hope. They would try and steal their faith in God, their faith in their country, their faith in their families. They said, their fa your families have forgotten you. Your country doesn't care about you. They're just warmongers trying to make money. Father would stand up. He would listen to, listen to lectures. They, at some points, had six to eight hours of lectures about communism each day. Uh, and then they were supposed to go and talk about it in small groups. But Father would stand up very calmly and with the simplest of <laughs> answers would remind all of the men that God was real, that their country was going to come and get them eventually, and that their family certainly hadn't forgotten about him. One of the most remarkable stories, um, I think, or uh, testimonies is, is by Lieutenant Mike Dow, who was one of Capon's good friends in the camp. And he says, um, at night, he would sneak around to the houses, to the huts where the men were living. And he says, uh, he would step in quietly and quickly and say, the Lord be with you. And the starving, torpid men lying on straw mats would sit up and respond as he had taught them and with thy spirit. Then he would say a quick general service, beginning with a prayer for the men who had died in Korea, both in battle and in prison, and for the sick and wounded and for the folks back home. Then he would say a prayer of thanks for God for the favors that he had granted us, whether we knew about them or not. 
for the food and wood and water we have received at the hands of our enemies. Then he'd speak very briefly a short, simple sermon, urging them to hold on and not to lose hope of freedom. Above all, he urged us not to fall for the lying doctrines the Reds were trying to pound into our heads. Be not afraid of them who kill the body, he'd say, quoting from the scriptures. Fear ye him who, after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. In his soiled and ragged fatigues, with his scraggly beard and his queer woolen cap made of the sleeve of an old GI sweater pulled down over his ears, he looked like any other half-starved prisoner. But there was something in his voice and bearing that was different, a dignity, a composure, a serenity that radiated from him like a light. Wherever he stood was holy ground, and the spirit within him, a spirit of reverence and abiding faith, went out to the silent, listening men and gave them hope and courage and a sense of peace. By his very presence, somehow, he could turn a stinking, louse-ridden mud hut for a little while into a cathedral. You guys want to change? So Father eventually gets sick. I think a lot of it was because he was out there serving. He wasn't sleeping much. He was giving away a lot of his food. I'm convinced that if he had wanted, he could have made it home from the camp, being hearty and uh, uh, you know healthy, not wounded when he went in. But he, he chose to offer his life so that the other men could live. Eventually, the communists found out that he was sick, and they decided to take him away. And they took him to what they called the hospital, but what the, the other men in the camp knew as the death house, because hardly anyone ever came back. It was a place where if you were too weak to eat, they would set your food down at the front, um, the doorway, and say, you've got to get it yourself. It was uh, just a terrible, filthy place, no medicine, anything like that. Well, when... When the communists came to take him away, the men were willing to stand up, risk their lives for Father. His response was, you know, guys, don't get in trouble for me. Don't worry about me. I'm going where I always wanted to go, and when I get there, I'll say a prayer for you. Now, up to that point, you know, we've been talking about hope. He inspired hope a lot of ways, you know, in an earthly sense, but there was always something higher. You know, again, it was for that sense of prayer. But with these last words, you know, if that doesn't point us to heaven, <laughs> I don't know what will. And as the men took him away, they insisted they wanted to carry him up the hill to the death house. They were amazed that he would stop them when they went by the guards, when they went by the, the commandant, who was the worst of them, of the camp. And he said, forgive me if I've done anything wrong to you during your time here. He said, I forgive you. Uh, echoing the words of our Lord, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. And he, he made his blessing over the communist guards, commandant, as he went by on his way up to the death house, forgiving them, praying for them, forgiving his enemies, just like our Lord. Well, it wasn't long, just a couple of days before Father died there in the death house on his own, with our Lord, obviously. Uh, May 23rd, 1951. The men who were with him in the camp um, had a, a beautiful crucifix carved by a Jewish prisoner who never met him. Um, when he was carving it, the guards came and said, who is this that you're carving? And his, his quickest response uh, that he could think of was, it's Abraham Lincoln. And uh, the guards looked at it and said, okay. <laughs> this was before he was on the cross, obviously. Um, Apparently they thought Abraham Lincoln was a good guy for freeing the slaves, and, uh, and he was. But um, when they put him on the, the cross, they quickly realized who this was and why he had carved it in, in honor of their chaplain. The guards hated this crucifix, but they were too afraid to do anything about it until the very end, and they didn't want it to leave the prison camp. This was in 1953, two years after Father had died. And the men who were with him were willing to risk their lives once again to bring this crucifix, to bring a pyx that Father Capon used out of the camp. They were willing to stay there in captivity to bring these things home. Sure enough, the communists relented and they were able to bring him across. And it's because of them that we know his story. Uh, they, they did a fantastic job of getting the word out uh, and sharing the story in the 50s and beyond. And they're really... Uh, you know, shared, carried on his legacy in that way. 
Now, most of these guys who were with him assumed that his body was lost there in a mass grave along the Yalu River, which is the river. Uh, if, if you had been buried there, there's really little to no chance that we'd ever see his remains uh, because of the, the changing in waters and, and just the conditions and everything. Uh, and it was sad. For over 70 years, that's basically what was thought. Uh, we've now come to realize that when Father was buried, uh, the guards would pick out who would bury them, and uh, they picked out two or three American soldiers, uh, and for whatever reason, when they carried his body out of the death house, they turned around, and the guards didn't follow them. And so they seized the opportunity not to take him to the, the mass grave, but to take him in town behind this hut. And they dug down as deep as they could. They could only get about 18 inches with their hands. They didn't have any tools. The ground was still pretty frozen from the winter. They laid him there. They covered as much as they could, got some rocks to cover the rest of the way to protect his body, said a quick prayer, and left. Now, that story finally made its way back to us only in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so there was a little bit of hope maybe that his remains had come out of the prison camp. Well, a year ago, in, in March, of 19, or March 4th, uh, last year, uh, it was announced by the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency that his remains had been identified in Hawaii. And um, thanks to the Cape and Kapan family, Cape and family, they, they <laughs> go by both, um, he was brought back to Wichita uh, and is now with us in the cathedral uh, at the end of September. And uh, hopefully you guys have time. It's, it's about a 12-minute video, and then I might ask or answer a few questions as well. Um, but I think it's just a great video that shows his homecoming. And I think um, it shows, again, the sense of hope that he inspired is something that still continues. Because, you know, we may not be in a prison camp. We may not be on the battlefield. But if you look at the events of the last, gosh, decade, more, whatever, however long back you want to go, you know, we need hope just as much as, as they did. And I think um, there's so many things in our world, um, you know, it's hope that will motivate us to keep going. And, and I think Father still wants to be there for us, for people, um, just as he was you know, in the days when he was alive. And so um, hopefully we got the video coming. Um, the video will speak for itself. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Davis speaking. Pleased to have you on board here tonight for a very special flight as we honor uh, Chaplain upon for his bravery and his humanity and for the way in which God used him to fight for the liberties that we enjoy and also how God worked through him to provide to so many people dignity in death and trying to summarize in my own mind the gravity of this event it uh, it came to me as feeling of honor of gratitude of indebtedness of thankfulness and of awe today as I was standing at the memorial structure that had Father Capon's name etched in it. As I walked down the hill, a light rain started falling and it occurred to me that perhaps God was sharing a few tears as well. Thank you ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. Have a nice flight and welcome aboard. isn't hardly anyone that can't appreciate and even identify with this sense of coming home. You know, that, that means something to us as human beings. This experience, I think, resonates with all human beings who know what it feels like when you finally can come home. It was a great honor to have the uh, remains of Father Capon come to our cathedral. If he is going to be a saint, it would be wonderful if the people of Hawaii can honor Father Capon as well and to be in his presence. I think it will be something that I will remember for a long time. When I first became commander of the POW MIA accounting mission in 2012, DPA's predecessor. I read about Father Capon 
receiving posthumously the Congressional Medal of Honor. Our unit was charged with his recovery. And back then in 2013, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great, miraculous, if one day our unit, our agency, found the remains of Father Capon? We have a responsibility not to forget those that gave their life. As a scientist, uh, I rarely ever say something is 100%. But with Father Capon's remains, um, I am 100% sure it is Father Capon, based on all the analysis, historical and also scientific analysis we did. It is Father Capon. It really is Father Capon. Now, I, I always knew we would probably someday have to do the Medal of Honor. I mean, because that always seemed attainable. You know, the sainthood process always kind of seemed attainable. But to find his remains, no. Never, ever thought it would ever come through. We went out the front doors. And uh, to see all those people, you, you could feel the love they had for him. And to see all the lab technicians had their hands over their hearts and, and, and all the military standing there saluting him. It just, I mean, it tore my heart out. It'll never be forgotten. You know, the respect that was paid to him as we made our way back here to Wichita, the airlines, you know, just to show their profound respect for this fallen soldier, I, I was really impressed by all of that. It's a privilege and an honor to help coordinate this travel for Chaplain Capon. I'm a better person for what I've witnessed over the last 36 hours. Seeing the honor that's paid towards this hero that none of us have ever met. Uh, so thank you for letting American Airlines uh, do the honor of bringing Chaplain Capon back home. Uh, safe travel. Ladies and with a uh, great deal of pleasure, we welcome you here to uh, Wichita. We're going to be uh, getting one more water salute uh, in just a few moments. Thanks so very much for your attention. Thanks for traveling, American, and welcome. When we pulled up and, and went through the last water cannon, I saw Paul Roach, you know, this frail guy, standing as straight as can be and just just wanting to be there to welcome, welcome Father home. He saw him as a fellow soldier. He saw him as his friend. He saw him as someone who saved his life. It's hard to tell about being with him again. But we were glad to have him back home. The timing of finding him, there was a point, there was a purpose behind that. I absolutely believe it. People today really need him. People who've been born well after he died. I think he helps remind people that no matter how hard it gets, it's so important to love and take care of others. The amount of people when we pulled into Pilsen on Saturday, just, you know, they were there because Father was coming home. I mean, they, you know, they've prayed to him forever. And the tears and the, just the, I mean, that, that love and pulling into there was the, the most heartwarming thing I've ever witnessed. I wish to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Father Cape and his home. He is home.
I would not have wanted to be anywhere else but in uh, St. John's Church in Pilsen to celebrate with the parish um, this Mass of Thanksgiving. Here, young Emil grew into the man God needed him to become, a man of virtue, a man of values, a man who knew and wasn't afraid to roll up his sleeves and work hard. 70 years waiting and praying for him to come home. And he was finally here. It just was almost surreal. He just, I just never thought that day would ever come. My wife and I, we wanted to take care of a couple of the POWs. You know, these, these guys are the reason why we know the stories of Father Emil. These guys are the ones who never stop talking about Father Emil. And so this moment, we wanted to make sure that they had their moment with Father Emil. I had a prisoner of war camp hat. I decided I would present it to him as a memento from all the POWs came in contact with. Most of us are here, in fact, all of us in this room are here for Father Taken. I'd like to introduce to you a man who is here because of Father Taken. We have with us Herb Miller. You'll never find another man like him. Didn't matter if it was an enemy. He dragged that wounded man back and the best he could bandage him up. That's the kind of man he was. You don't have him like that anymore. In the military, we say we never leave a fallen comrade. And so the value that we place on human life and service, um, and for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice, to see the level of care and uh, effort that is taken to recover them, it's just awe-inspiring. The Army gives so much respect to the fallen. We want to go out of our way to show that that soldier's life mattered he'll get a caisson procession from Veterans Memorial Park uh, all the way to the cathedral. Once at the cathedral, we'll have our pallbearers and we'll have a color guard and we'll have a firing detail. And this is our, our way that we salute those who are departing our ranks. And it's a final goodbye from the army, from the unit to one of its own as they make that transition. Jeff, Emily, 5,500 people made their way to Hartman Arena tonight for the first of two memorial services for the late war hero. I look out on this crowd and realize that this is just a fraction of the lives that he touched. And it's just amazing, so I thank you all for being here. I'm going someplace where I've always wanted to be. And when I get there, I'll say a prayer for you. Uncle Emil, welcome home. We now have given new life to Father Capon, and more importantly to Father Capon's story, such that now that there's mortal remains, People can now look to that with a renewed sense of hope, a renewed sense of inspiration, and a renewed sense of love. Dear friends, allow me to bring my reflections on this solemn day to a close by extending to each of you an invitation. And it is simply this, come to his tomb. Pray there and sit there in the stillness of the beauty and peace that surrounds you. And let God speak to you through the example and the witness of this servant of God. Come to his tomb. Chaplain Father Emil Capon, servant of God, pray for us.
would if uh, you're ever out in Kansas, love to welcome you to Wichita, to the tomb, um, to Pilsen, his hometown. There's a, a museum there and everything as well. Uh, we also do a, a walking pilgrimage that ends the first Sunday in June every year. So it's from Wichita to Pilsen over four days. It's uh, June 2nd through 5th this year. So uh, if you're interested, check it out on our website, fathercapon.org. Um, obviously, we can't make it to the tomb today, but this morning before I, I came, I had the privilege of kneeling there in front of him and, and praying for all of you uh, who are here that uh, you know the Holy Spirit inspires you to be a saint, that uh, uh, the Father brings his sense of hope uh, to your lives and also you know that, that willingness, that spirit to go out and to, to share that with the lives of those around you as well. So um, I know we're a little bit over. Uh, we are still working on his cause for sainthood, so he's still a servant of God right now. It's the first step. Um, the next step would be he'd be named Venerable, which means that he lived a, a holy life. Uh, the congregation reviews their life very thoroughly and uh, uh, says, okay, we think this person is probably in heaven. Um, and then the next two steps are where the miracles come in. So there would be one potential miracle that's needed to be approved to get him to blessed. And then another one has to take place afterwards to, to get him to saint. So uh, if he's named a martyr, which uh, we're hopeful, but uh, we'll see what the congregation thinks. Uh, then he can skip that venerable and go straight to blessed. Um, but uh, we'll see. We're, we're still working, still praying. We certainly need prayers. Um, yeah, that's kind of the path. There's some, some different paths to, to each step. But um, we're, we're praying that we'll get there um, sometime in the near future. As I was talking to, to Deacon Lou, uh, if he's not in heaven, then I don't know. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of hope for the rest of us, I guess. Um, but uh, we certainly think he is, and it was, a, it was, in, yeah, it was, it was quite the privilege to be able to hold a, a funeral for him, um, to honor him, someone who we think is in heaven, but still deserves that, that Christian burial, and, and maybe, you know, needs those prayers in some way, too. So, uh, are there any questions? Open up for at least a few um, before we head off. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, to be honest with you, with the um, the stuff before this one, the uh, originally um, the path to, to venerable is, is traditionally through heroic virtue, which the congregation looks says for ten years, the last ten years of their life, did they live heroic virtue, and uh, the congregation for saints. So the, the next path, the offer of life, didn't come until 2017. So it was after we had already done the paperwork and everything. And um, the Congregation for Saints met, and they were like, well, you know, the, obviously the last year of his life was super heroic. And honestly, I think that they would have um, passed it on to the bishops who make up the congregation before the path of, hero of offer of life. And they would have said, yeah, you know, let's, let's move him forward. They, they came back to us and said, well, we think he fits very well with the offer of life because it's someone who lived a virtuous life, um, maybe not heroic like, you know, for the last 10 years, but like at the end of their life, willingly gave their life for others. And at first, honestly, when I heard that, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like, that's ridiculous. But as I got to thinking about it, it's kind of what you said, and, and we have a priest who says it very well. He's our vocations director, Father Chad Arnold. He says, you read through the books and the, the, you get a lot of that. You get a lot of, well, he was... He was fairly ordinary, kind of a normal, everyday guy. And um, it, in Korea, his moment came, and he answered the grace there, obviously. I mean, like, what he did in Korea, the circumstances and being willing to do it day in and day out was extraordinary. But everything that led up to that point, it, it was. It, it was simple. And I think there's a lot of hope there for all of us that we too can, can become saints and that we don't have to necessarily always be spectacular, but and maybe just being open to God's grace whenever the time comes. So yeah, absolutely. So I'm very confident, by the way, in the offer of life. Um, we just have to do a little bit of paperwork and stuff to get there. Um, if the, and if the martyrdom goes through, then even better. <laughs>
Pretty incredible. Um, so he's talking about uh, Capen's Men. Uh, it's on Formed. Um, we've, there's four different series. The, the very first video of the Virtue series has the, the Medal of Honor ceremony. It also has a couple of POWs, Herb Miller, Mike Dow in it. It's, it's, a, it's a great watch, uh, if, if nothing else, just to watch. But if you've got a group that can go through it, even better. But yeah, I am amazed. The, the Holy Spirit is at work. And I, I, I'll finish, I guess, with one story, because I usually get some questions about the miracles and um, what has become. So I have, I have different favorite stories <laughs> from different times of his life. This is the, the miracle story, and it's become part one of the miracle story because there's a part two that, that came afterwards. So um, one of the men who knew Father when he was alive um, was serving with him in Texas at, at Fort Bliss, Texas in 1949. He actually got assigned to live with Father Capon there. And he, he, was, uh, he said he was dating a Catholic girl. He wasn't Catholic at the time. He said, I knew I needed to talk to a, a priest at some point. But he said, it certainly was not my idea to have to live with one. <laughs> and he walks into the, the room, and there's this picture of the Blessed Mother on the wall. And he's like, oh, what did I get myself into? Well, it wasn't long before Father Capon had won him over, brought him into the church, taught him how to serve, and celebrated their wedding. Now, this guy's name was Osro Barkley, and he and his wife, Margaret, um, stayed in the United States. He didn't get sent over to the war, thankfully. They eventually heard about Father's death in 1953. Uh, in the meantime, they had been trying to conceive and, and everything and, and couldn't. Uh, they went to the doctor and they said, I'm sorry, Margaret, but um, you know, there's something with um, the way your reproductive system is, is set up that you physically can't have children. And so they were, they were disappointed, but they went home and they said, you know, let's ask Father to help us. And so they prayed and they said, Father, you knew us. You know that we wanted to start a family. Um, can you please help us? So sure enough, both Osro and Margaret get sick. They go to the doctor. And the doctor's like, well, Osro, I don't know what's wrong with you. But Margaret, you're pregnant. So she has her child, healthy child, ends up having two more ch children. And they go back to the doctor and they examine her and everything and say, absolutely nothing has changed. Nothing. All three of your children are miracles. And um, so I, this is fascinating. This is something that happened in the 50s, and I think it was wonderful. And when I found out, I said, well, can we use that for the miracle? And Father Hatsi, who's the, the, in charge of the cause, said, uh, unfortunately, no, because the doctors passed away and the hospital where all the records were burnt down, so we don't have any records. But I was like, well, okay, at least I can tell that, tell that story to people. So I, about a year and a half ago, I was at EWTN, and I, I told the story on EWTN. And when I got back, I had an email waiting for me um, from this gal uh, who had been in the Air Force for, for many years. And she and her husband, I, I ended up calling her, she and her husband had tried to conceive for about seven or eight years. Uh, no luck. They tried all the, the Catholic, you know, ways. They even had a surgery with the Pope Paul VI Institute uh, out of Omaha uh, to try and correct it. They said, well, if it worked, it'll probably be in the next year that you'll conceive. A year passed and nothing happened. Well, they heard about Father Capon's story through a priest who had given a mission at their parish, and he talked about him one night. And they decided to take a trip that summer um, to Steubenville, to the conference, and on the way back, the priest was in Cincinnati, and he was given a parish mission there, and so they stopped by again. The night he talked about Father Capon, they went up and talked to him, and he prayed over them, invoking Father's intercession. They get back. Sure enough, three weeks later, they conceive. Fast forward uh, to the birth of their son. They named him Samuel, and they texted the, this priest and said, hey, uh, you know, we had a, a healthy baby boy. He says, oh, congratulations, that's so wonderful. Do you have any idea what today is? And they're like, no. It was April 20th, 2016. Father's birthday was April 20th, 1916. A <laughs> hundred years to the day uh, of the birth. And you know, I'm on the phone with her, and I, like, I was already uh, pretty, you know, pretty uh, into it. And, realize like this is a pretty amazing story but when she told me that I was pretty much on the floor I was like you got to be kidding me and uh, they've since had three three kids as well and uh, we were blessed to, to welcome them I was able to meet them in person at, at the funeral and everything and it's just it's amazing um, you know a lot of the times we don't know how the Lord's going to answer our prayers but uh, sometimes we do hear stories like that or of father bringing peace to situations bringing hope 
And I think it's just um, a pretty incredible thing. And I think, again, the video um, shows that, that he, the Holy Spirit's using him to, to touch lives. And so hopefully he's inspired you in some way here tonight. Um, and um, feel free. I've got some stuff out there if you want. If nothing else, we've got some prayer cards and booklets that you can take home, pray the prayer, and um, pass the booklets out. But if you don't mind, um, I'll read this and we can all pray a little prayer for his canonization here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, in the midst of the folly of war, your servant, Chaplain Emil Kapan, spent himself in total service to you on the battlefields and in the prison camps of Korea until his death at the hands of his captors. We now ask you, Lord Jesus, if it be your will, to make known to all the world the holiness of Chaplain Kapan and the glory of his complete sacrifice for you by signs of miracles and peace. In your name, Lord, we ask, for you are the source of peace, the strength of our service to others, and our final hope. Amen. Servant of God, Chaplain Emil Kapan, pray for us. All right, thank you.